Yoga is really shelter from the storm. And if anybody listening to this podcast is in a point of their life of transformation, which is hello, all of us. Uh, <laughs> if you're going through anxiety, if you've suffered the loss of a loved one, if you're questioning why you're here, I cannot recommend enough you getting to the mat. Find some sort of practice that, that resonates with you and begin the journey of discovery inside your own body. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups, and there we are the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. Well, we have a treat for y'all today. As you know, Miss Julie Piat, AKA Srimati, is a mystic, she's a yogi, she's a musician, an artist, chef, author, and healer. Whew. Yes, <laughs> she's also on the side, the mother of four children and finds the divine in all experiences in life, beautiful and challenging alike. Julie has created over 300 plant-based recipes for a series of best-selling cookbooks and is the author of the plant-based Cheese Bible, I'm gonna show it to you. This cheese is nuts. She co authored the internationally acclaimed books Plant Power Way and the Plant Power Way Italia with her husband, Rich Roll. He talked movingly about Julie on our episode 156 that Rich was on about how much his wife has inspired him and what a big part of his success she is. If you haven't heard that, Julie, you should tune in. Actually, it's, it's very sweet and very emboldening. You can hear her interviewed as well on many of his shows. And she also has her own podcast, which y'all may not know, called The Life of Me. Julie's known for her not cheese and created Shri Mu not cheese to bring delicious plant-based flavors into our kitchen. Today, we get to talk to her about healthy living, spiritual development, and of course, plant-based cheese. So gosh, welcome to the show, finally, Julie. Oh, Dotsie, thank you so much for that lovely intro. I'm really, really excited to be here and honored to share the time with you and Alexandra. And so just thank you, thank you. Yeah. I think I was maybe possibly one of the first five to um, order your Shri Mu cheese. Like I remember, I don't know, you remember the oddest things in life, right? And I remember that I was visiting a friend up in LA and I was in West Hollywood at a coffee shop and it was like, okay, today's the day you can sign up to get Shri Mu delivered to your house. <laughs> I remember ordering and being so, so excited. And, and it was, I believe it was somewhat before the holidays and I, I took a lot of it home to my family and then they were as enraptured as I was with the, with the taste. So, and, and everything about it, the consistency too, uh, but we're going to get into the cheese, but like I told you before we started, we, we want to dive into your spirituality. Uh, it's, it's dip, it's deep and it's rich and um, it's such an important aspect of your life that you share uh, and encourage others with. And I didn't mention it in the intro, but you also had a long career in the fashion industry before your incarnation as a plant-based entrepreneur. And fashion, I, I've been in fashion, uh, Alexandra's been in fashion, is the tough, and maybe let's call it a little bit more superficial business to be in. Um, and it can seem at odds with someone who values more spiritual pursuits. So wondering if you were always interested in developing your spirituality spirituality or did it kind of come to you slowly? 
Yeah, thanks, Dotsy. So, um, well, I was born with the gene. I was one of those people that just showed up always wanting to know what was beyond this life. Um, so I was involved in spirituality as a young child, even. I uh, caught a ride to church with the neighbors because I was the fifth kid and my parents had stopped going to church. <laughs> and when and we were in a Christian uh, format uh, in that period of my life. And so when I learned about this guy, Jesus, I just was like, this dude is the, is, is the shit. He's the, yeah. he's awesome. <laughs> so I just tried to get to ride with the neighbors so I could continue to study that. And I mean, I literally was probably seven years old, seven, eight years old. So I've always been one that was oriented towards that perspective. Um, when I was in fashion, I mean, you know, it's a long story, so I've, I've lived a long life. So yeah. we'll just jump to fashion. Um, yeah, I was creating fashion, which was a very creative time of, of my life. And, uh, you know, what I've learned is that living a life of beauty is actually the first tenet of a spiritual life. So humans, we are sensuous beings. We're, sens sens we're, we're connected to the senses. We're sensual. We want to feel and taste and touch and love and commune. And so it's really part of our nature to be immersed in beauty. Fashion for me was a creative outlet. I've, I've always been, a, you know, the one with the grooviest pants in the room or the <laughs> one with, you know, people run after me on the street. Like, where did you get that? Where did, like, that's a common thing. So it was a very prolific, beautiful, creative um, expansion that I stepped into um, after one of my first dark nights of my life, uh, which was being in a, an abusive uh, marriage where I was a, basically a battered woman. Um, <laughs> so I came out of that. Uh, How and, old were you at that period of time? Oh, I was in my 20s, my young, impressionable mm -hmm. yeah. 20s when, you know, you get caught up in that. And it, it really happened because I had been a shadow musician my whole life. So I knew I was a musician singer at age six and then I didn't do it. And so I idolized musicians and I met this music manager mm -hmm. who enticed me into that world. And um, so it was a very, uh, very profound learning experience. I call it a vital step in my mastery um and lucky for me this lifetime i got out um, and never repeated it again so it really was a karmic experience but when i met my two oldest boys father uh, lou pyatt i um i was welcomed into his embrace in a in a very loving nurturing way unconditional love and during that marriage, I was able to really develop my creative being. And I found out that in fact, I'm a completely creative being on all different levels. But it was really during my marriage, my 10 year um, marriage with him that I was able to expand into that. So during that mm -hmm. time, I launched Julie Pyatt Collection. It was a bridge women's sportswear line, which means that I, ha I hung with Anna Sui, Mark Eisen, A-Line, uh, CK, which was Calvin Klein at the time. Uh, and uh, I had, I was on the, on the cover of Women's Wear Daily. Um, I was selling all the stores in the country, Fred Siegel, Neiman Marcus, Barney's, Nordstrom, like sort of everyone, Macy's. And, uh, but even during that time, um, I had this sort of frustration after working so many hours and seeing also the level of waste and just, it's a, it's a salacious, you know, industry. It just eats you alive. Like it never stops. Like you're mm -hmm. constantly looking for the next thing. There's no rest. There's no peace. There's no Ooh. presence. It's just mania. Um, I went to some venue in Hollywood and, and heard Deepak Chopra speaking. And so that was sort of my first seven spiritual laws of a success, sort of my first four -way, foray into that sort of genre of, of spiritual awareness. And, um, and so I, I was even back then um, building this connection to something deeper. Uh, but it wasn't, at, it, it definitely wasn't where I am now. I had not started practicing yoga yet this lifetime. And so when my boys were probably one and two, uh, I closed my garment company and I found yoga. And then that catalyzed uh, quite a big shift. Tell us 
us a little bit about, yes, what, how yoga um, deepened your spirituality and, and gave you that regular ritual, because um, I heard you speaking a bit about how important it is to you. And um, I realized that my yoga is very different from your yoga. <laughs> very funny. <Yeah. laughs> well, um, I always say in, in my experience, you know, life is full of um, challenges and initiations, we could call them, you know, as we go through the human life of becoming. So, you know, from my perspective, we are all from the one breath and we came individuated into these different life forms to experience life and experiences of all different flavors, all different um, sort of colors on the spectrum to return to the one breath, to, to return back to the one breath. And in my awareness, the pro practice of asana, which is was the first portal entry for me, which is physical postures, mm. um, has become or, or, or has been and is still shelter from the storms. And what it does is if you can think of your body, so there's many ways to speak to that one breath, the force. And movements of a body is a language, it's a communication. So what asana really is, is your body is communicating to life through the postures. Now, in addition, you're activating life force, which is prana, life force, energy, which is connecting you to this realm of which we are a part, so the earth. So it doesn't even really matter, um, like even in my own spiritual community that I mentor, Water Tiger, uh, I don't use Sanskrit terms a lot, or I'm not caught in the lineage. And it's like I say, I love the lineage, but I'm not of the lineage, um, which means that um, I am free. I am a free sovereign being. So my experience of being in different traditions or different disciplines, like people say, oh, you're into yoga, you must be so disciplined. It's like, I am not disciplined. I live my life as a free creative being and no two days are alike. And if you give me like a program that has a schedule, I am not going to do that program like ever. Yeah. It's just how I am, you know? And, uh, and so yoga is really shelter from the storm. And if anybody listening to this podcast is in a point of their life of transformation, which is hello, all of us. Uh, <laughs> if you're going through anxiety, if you've suffered the loss of a loved one, if you're questioning why you're here, I cannot recommend enough you getting to the mat. Find some sort of practice that, that resonates with you and begin the journey of discovery inside your own body because it's inside the body that your treasures are waiting for you. Um, mm -hmm. The heart uh, is, is known by the universe better than you know it yourself. And if you can travel through this body with your awareness, with your breath, um, and it's not about hitting hot yoga six days a week. You know, I, in my experience, I've seen a lot of people that have done that. And, you know, I'm not, I'm talking to the, you know, celebrated athlete Dotsie here. So, but if you, if you hit it and deplete yourself, I got that, stuck in that, Julie, that's what I was doing. Like, two, like 2019, the whole year. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of cool for a while. It's kind of cool for a while. And it is and you get really dehydrated. Exactly. Well, what happens is if you look at uh, the health of those people, maybe in 20 years or maybe even 10 years, mm. um, I find a sunken quality, a drawn quality, a sallow quality. Yeah. It's like you're depleting the amrita, the oh. juice of your life. So, you know, yoga is very like, you know, there's yogis that do, let's say, maybe eight postures until they're 120 or you know mm -hmm. in the in the yogi tradition you know there are people beings that live hundreds of years and i'm not saying that that should be the goal of every person you know mm -hmm. i think you should be in communion with your death and and each one of us is different you know and and really use facing death as a way to really live a vibrant life like a connected life an alive life and so yoga for me still, it's like, even this morning, I had two calls before you guys. And it's like, I have my mat here in my room. I get into these postures. 
I did postures yesterday and it's not for me now because I've done it so many years. It's my own private experience, you know, in the middle of the night, I was up at 3 a.m. this morning doing meditation, not because I set an alarm, because I woke up and I wanted to do it. It was like, oh, I'm awake and it's dark and it's the mystery and the, you know, I've got the ears of the greater aspect of me. And so let me, let me drop into this meditation. And why do we practice yoga really is to be able to sit for meditation. So it's about keeping the body supple and flexible and fluid. And when I teach yoga, and I, I should mention, because I always forget, I have a four-part yoga series on the platform iFit. So yeah. they filmed it. They did a beautiful job. They didn't, they spared no expense. They filmed me at my house and also at the spiritual community of Dom and Her, mm -hmm. uh, which I am connected to an initiate of. Um, so if you guys want to check it out, it's a very um, spiritual um, uh, four-part practice. One of the modules is about vital health. Uh, one of the modules is trauma into treasure. Mm. What is about, one is about transforming grief into awareness. And one is about li living a victorious life. So supporting you and activating your mm. highest heroic probability. So I still say, if I have to go to a desert island, I'm taking my yoga with me. And yes. it, it has given me this amrita, this nectar, this beauty, beautiful devotion of life, which is what allows me to live this deeply uh, connected mystical life, which is the joy of my heart. Um, yeah. 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 Alexandra, teachable moment. Um, this just was how is yours different uh because I, well i was ironically uh doing my yoga practice and listening to julie on a podcast while i was doing it for my research and she actually in that podcast made a comment about how a lot of people's yoga when they listen to like podcasts i just started laughing <laughs> there i was well, um, that's so funny, but Alexandra, it's okay if you're listening to me when you're, exactly. no, it's not, it's not actually. Actually, oh, no. no, but Julie, I have to say, um, you, you definitely, you are, when you talk about this, you definitely made me think because I am a person who, um, decided when I was 18, after being raised in, uh, the Protestant church and going to church on Sundays and going to a school where we went to chapel every morning, um, that, religion was not for me, which I equated with spirituality. And I know you can unpack that um, because they didn't deal with the issues that I cared about, which was helping the world, the very planetary practical world of the environment and animals and voting rights and things like that. So I'd like you to speak to that because I know that you have a philosophy about it and that you feel spirit, your spirituality has actually made you the person to go out and change the world. I tend to um, draw in people that have lost their connection to spirituality. Mm. And the reason is because they feel the unconditional love and freedom from the dogma or isms or control systems. So from my awareness and my uh, life experience, religions are dogmas, they are, um, they are like a political system. They are um, uh, systems to suppress, to contain, to control, to siphon your life energy. And so what I would say is that I'm, I'm connecting with spirituality from that one breath. You could call it one breath or source or the force or God. If you know, God's a very loaded question for many of us and rightly so. But uh, when you understand that there is no life form that is better or worse than any other life form. And when you understand that uh, you don't need an intermediary to commune with the spiritual aspect of what it means to be a human, be a human being. So I used to say we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And now I say we're multidimensional beings having a simultaneous experience spiritual energy is part of it's fi at least 50% of who we are. I would say it's more connected maybe to the 
feminine qualities that have been silenced, eradicated. So let's go, let's go to, let's go to animal violence, but then let's go beyond violence against women. Okay. So thousands of years ago, the feminine was completely eradicated out of the spirituality of this planet. Mm. Like we were the keepers of the flame. We were the benevolent leaders, the guides, the ones that knew how to guide for the better of the community, for harmony with nature. And when you look at it, um, you know, we were burned at the stake for healing someone with plants, you know, and I was, I was having a podcast with a happy pair a few months ago and they were like, Julie, you know, like the witch, like you would have been like the witch. And I said, what do you mean? You would have been the witch. I was like, you, you're in plant-based, you know, expression. You would have been also the witch. Yeah. But, um, so the point is, is that, uh, we need to reclaim, this is what this moment is about, this virus, this transformation. It's not like any other time in the history of the planet. It's not at all. Stop mm -hmm. looking at history because that has nothing to do with that. This is a quantum expansion into reclaiming the divinity of our humanity, which we have been cut off from. And that is why we're, uh, we're uh, you know, violent, violent with animals, violent with nature, violent with ourselves, violent with our mothers, with our children, you know, the sexual predators, like it's, it's just inherent in this realm. And we can just say, okay, it was by design. And that was then. And this is now. And if we've mm -hmm. taken a body right now, and if you're involved and you care about life affirming expressions, it doesn't have to be big. No one has to know who you are. I mean, singing a song or creating a painting connected to God, to some beautiful feeling you have, even a dance, poetry. These are things that are the greatest things you can do for humanity. Um, but if you're here alive um, and you're here for this experiment, as we go through this transformation, um, you came here to reawaken your connection to spirituality. And there is nobody listening to this podcast that is less spiritual than I am or more spiritual than I am. Mm. Um, you know, the, it's, there's an equanimity. It's a choice. It's a choice. There are definitely those of us who don't feel connected with the life force around us, nor connected with the life force within us. And so embarking on that journey, what are some of your daily rituals to get in touch with the life force? Let's say somebody's listening. They're like, I don't even know where to flip and start. Like this sounds <laughs> pretty incredible. And I'm, 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 I'm vibing with what Julie's saying. Um, we've, you mentioned 3 a.m. Sometimes you get up at 3 a.m. and have a fire ceremony. So that's an option for people. And sometimes you meditate like you did uh, last night. But what are, some, what are some of the ways that people could kind of toe into getting in touch with the life force? Yeah, well, again, I have to go back to yoga. There, there's just no substitute. And, you know, it, it, it'll take a minute. Like you might have to look around and find the right studio or find the right teacher or find something that resonates with you. And I don't even have any. Can you just start in your living room? Like, do you have to go get a teacher for um, the introverts that are listening? I, I really think you, you should probably. Okay. You probably um, should go, you know, get some instruction so that you can get into you know, so, yes, of course you could start in your living room, but it might be really supportive to find a community, you know, around that. Rich and I met in one of those communities. We were in the same yoga class. Mm. Um, and then after he met me, he stopped practicing yoga. No, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> then he became an ultra athlete. <laughs> no. like, um, you're doing enough for both of us. So, so definitely yoga. I mean, yoga is a thing, but I guess for me, it's just, just, just taking a breath Okay, and just everybody listening to this, just let's just take a breath together. And let's just exhale that breath and let's allow our body to register that you are enough right now, as you are right now in this moment, before you've earned any titles or achieved any outward success or gained fame or fortune or been in a relationship, how about if you just receive yourself as a divine emanation of this one breath 
right now. So let's just start with being a divine being, with recognizing that you are sacred. There is nothing more or less sacred than you are. There is no place for competition. Sorry, Dotsie Olympic it's athlete. Okay. There's no place for competition. There's no place for comparison. Guess what? There's only one of you in the entire omniverse. That means anywhere there's life, not even, not even just this planet, beyond this planet. So humans are always looking for consensus in the human mind. But if we were supposed to have a consensus, then two of us would be alike and none of us are. Mm. So what, are, what illusion are we in? Like, who are we competing against? What are we fighting for? Who are we judging or analyzing? And I always use this example of animals, which is why my spiritual mentorship group is called Water Tiger, is it's, a, it's a, an analogy to understand that if I'm a tiger and if Dotsie's a horse, the tiger is not gonna go, I gotta go over and I gotta talk to that horse. I'm gonna have to go over and tell that horse that I don't like its skin because it should be patterned like mine. I mean, you can see very quickly the idiocy of that. It mm -hmm. makes no sense. So if we can just stop with this whole posturing about, you know, I'm better than, I'm worse than, I know the best way to be, if, the, if these other people didn't do that, then everything would be, you know, this whole dialogue. How about you just return within yourself and embody who you are? And if you are feeling judgmental, um, violent, uh, you know, analytical or needing to uh, direct your attention outward on others, um, it is because you have not received yourself well enough. You have not given yourself that love. Yeah. And one of my biggest techniques right now is I am always with this little picture of myself. I just turned 60 in July. And I have this picture of myself when I was six years old. I'm the little brunette. <laughs> and so, I, folks, go to the YouTube so you can see her. Oh. It looks like a class picture. Is that what uh, it no, is? No, it's a wedding. A wedding. Okay. Oh, I see. Yes, yeah. And wedding. I'm just the little, the little brunette in the front. And the point is, is that in, my, in Water Tiger, I'm... We're on a exploration of rediscovery to fall in love with ourselves and to understand that that little child, what you love to do at the age of six, what just brought you joy, what delighted you, um, that is where your treasures lie to what your life is about, to what you were supposed to do when you came here. And, you know, as many of us women, or, you know, we could just say busy modern people, you know, we tend to put ourselves last, you know, I've, I have four children, you know, I can't tell you the amount of times there was a bite of food on the way to my mouth that was usurped by another little hand and that there it goes. And of course, that's what, that's what we do. But, um, you know, to really understand how to advocate for you. So what if you were able to receive yourself, this inner child, this six-year-old, and just take one day and every decision that happens that day uh consider that little child first mm -hmm. that's your first responsibility and just do it as an experiment and see where you are not holding space for yourself mm -hmm. because there is no reason to judge another human being or to you know and the more we know the more you go down the path and you have experiences the more we practice and the more we experience the more we understand how little we know you know it's in fact in the not knowing and so this is the devotional aspect um, but i am going to mention that exercise is not the same as yoga and hot yoga with you know loud music is not the same as meditating mm -hmm. and meditating to apps is probably not the same as meditating. I mean, I don't know, I don't use a lot of apps, but I guess I would just ask like, can you, you know, just connect to your breath and do a long draw, long inhale up through the nose, long, deep and free, 
pause at the top, and then exhale long. And you might want to extend that exhale to twice as long as your inhale, hold at the bottom. And then again, inhale long, deep, fluid free. And you're going to stop at the top. And then you're going to exhale again, long, deep, fluid exhale and pause. So can you do that for some rounds? You know, it might be a minute, it might be five minutes. It doesn't really matter the time, but it's starting to connect with the witness that is always watching what is going on. So it's like, you can be in action. I mean, here I am, I'm an entrepreneur. I have a plant-based cheese company that hopefully we're going to talk about. No, I'm kidding. Um, but, you know, I mean, I do a lot of things. It's not that I don't do anything. I do many things. And yet I have this immersion in this oneness that gives me this presence. So it's sort of detached action. Um, because I'm always immersed in that breath. And again, this is a yoga practice teaches you that. And, and I've been in hot yoga classes, so I don't, I'm not knocking hot yoga. Like it can be amazing and you can really learn and get into some places in your body. I'm just saying, let's not just beat it till it's completely dead. Let's understand there are different notes. You know, there's a yin practice, there's a morning practice, there's an afternoon practice. So just don't do, you know, make sure that you have a holistic connected practice that is cultivating a devotion to life, a devotion to yourself as a sacred emanation of this one breath. And that is nourishing and comforting and full of grace. You mentioned about exercise and how that is very different from a spiritual practice, um, even though it might have the same name, yoga. Uh, it can be both exercise or it can be a spiritual practice. You, you, you mentioned uh, your husband, Rich Roll, who he's an endurance athlete. He's also a lawyer who's educated at Stanford and Cornell. So he's very physical and cerebral. And you, on the other hand, come from the spirit and uh, the feminine. And I would like to hear your advice on how to successfully be in relationship with someone whose way of moving in the world is so different from yours. It's yeah. advice for me because that's my husband, very fit, physical and very cerebral. And that's it. That's it. That's where that's it's it. At. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Same well, way. you know, again, um, so uh, I'm going to tell a, a story of, of how Rich and my life was catalyzed into this beautiful um, collision of opposites, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't make any sense on paper, sort of. Uh, but we were, you know, we met in this yoga class. So he was, he was obviously looking for girls in the yoga class. You know. um, it wasn't duh. a spiritual pursuit. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so, you know, it was this thing, like I was completing a 10 year marriage and my boys were quite young, three and four years old. Um, and a as you can tell now, I've been married three times. So for me, relationship isn't about I'm married to one person my whole life. It's about being present in the relationship while it's working. But I'm not one. I can't. Uh, I don't stay in things that aren't 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 evolving. I just I don't have the ability to do that. Um, so so that was completing. Um, and I I met Rich and uh, and he was looking for like a twenty something year old because he had been in a failed very short marriage um and then i was just looking to date lots of people because i'd been in a 10-year marriage and when i met him and spoke to him i knew immediately i was like oh no like this is a marrying guy like this right. isn't just because we knew each other from other lifetimes like it was a memory you know i knew him i already knew him so because I had two little boys and I was absolutely not going to parade any men around my kids, I would not uh, let him meet them for, uh, you know, almost a year. And so also that gave us the cadence where it probably would have been too much for him as well. Like he probably would have freaked out or, but so I, I saw him when I didn't have the kids. And then when I had the kids, I didn't see him. Um, and then it just sort of naturally morphed into that, but it was an interesting journey. So really quick for this first seven years, um, he was struggling. He's a recovering alcoholic and 
he was struggling in his career, struggling in his energy, like a lot of density, a lot of extreme emotions. And I, the yogi, was like, here, take this fruit. Here, my love, take this fruit. And as I kept offering him solutions, he became more and more paralyzed. So then I was like, wow, mm -hmm. like maybe I'm just too much for him. And like, I should dim myself because the more that I am expressing, the more paralyzed he's becoming. And clearly he was eating in and out burgers by the, you know, four at a time and Starbucks coffee with venti, three ad shots to a venti Starbucks. I mean, anything would cause a heart attack in me in two seconds. So, you know, I was on the surface, like what I was doing was, it was uh, well-intentioned and all these things. And I had a lot of conversations with my girlfriends who were telling me how right I was. I was so right. And uh, mm. there, there was even- <laughs> Love those girlfriends. <laughs> those girlfriends, ooh. And then, uh, but my marriage wasn't changing still. And, uh, you know, uh, I had been married twice before. So I was, not a, a, I was not a novice to divorce and the woes and pain and suffering of that trajectory. No matter if you choose it or someone else chooses it, it's just a two-year hellhole that you have to go yeah. through. Yeah. So, um, so I was studying with an Indian master, uh, the, the master who named me Mananda Srimati. And uh, he started talking to me about divine love. And he said, divine love is like the sun. It simply shines on all creation without discernment or analysis or judgment of any kind. And he said, in human love is a business arrangement. It says, if you behave in this way, then I will love you. And if you do not behave in those ways, I will take my love from you. Mm -hmm. And it was like that, you know, 25th ski lesson that you get from the instructor <laughs> where it just, for some reason I was ready. It went into my cells. I got it. I called Rich. We had broken up for like a day. I kicked him out. I had a little baby. I was like, you have to leave. And then, you know, in a day we were back in each other's arms. So it didn't last very long. Um, I called him and I just said, I, uh, I need to apologize to you. I said, I have had my energy in your space and I was wrong. And I said, I'm going to reclaim my energy and I'm going to release you to your life. And so I released him to understanding that he was an emanation of God, eating in and out burgers and drinking Starbucks with venti ad shots. It's not for me, like if I know that I'm an emanation of God, then he is an emanation of God, the way that he is right now, right at this moment. And it was that action that catalyzed Rich Roll into who he is today, literally that action. Wow. Because that action, first of all, he was like, wait, I don't trust her. There must be an ambush in the bushes. <laughs> right. Because this was totally you know, contrary to any way that I had acted. But then if you ask him, he felt it. Like he was like, oh, she's not in my space anymore. And then it made him have to look at himself rather than push against me and say, oh, well, I feel this way because of her and like she's doing this or whatever. So I left him in his own experience and then some months went on and he was going through, you know, the training. No, maybe the training hadn't started yet. So he said, babe, you know, I want to do a cleanse. One of those cleanses you've been trying to get me to do for a while. And I said, oh, great. Like in the moment, I was like, great. And then a week would pass and he was like, did you get me the herbs? And I'd look at him. Literally, I got mind wiped by my greater soul or his, I don't know, happened six times. I was laughing so hard because the old me would have had all the herbs ready for him and the how-to book and the whole thing. But literally my body just didn't move. So by the time I got him the herbs, he was so angry and like so frustrated <laughs> that he did the program and we didn't even think that he was gonna have to go off coffee. So he was literally shaking in the corner uh, like he was coming off heroin. Yeah. And even at that point though, I had no, no desire or attachment to, is he gonna make the cleanse? Is he gonna quit the cleanse? Is, like I had nothing to do with it. I was just watching him like an interesting movie, like, oh my goodness, look at him. Um, and so then that's the story where, you know, he ends up becoming an Ultraman plant-based athlete doing double Ironman races. Uh, but it was that decision that catalyzed this trajectory, which then later led to 
really the universe just creating his heart's deepest desires, mm -hmm. uh, which was a result of many rituals and ceremonies that I did over years of really catalyzing uh, his greatest dreams, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and our dreams as a family as well. Mm -hmm. What it a great like, story. What yeah. a great story about just letting be an acceptance. Uh, <laughs> exactly what I was going to say. Complete and total acceptance is what it's like. Everyone try this. I'm telling you. And, and yeah. if you are having a uh, head buddings or like walls in your relationship, no matter how it is, why don't you try taking yourself out of the energetic situation mm -hmm. but you must do it in devotion you must understand that that being is every bit as revered as you are mm -hmm. that is loved so you can't do it as a i'm gonna now i'm not talking to you no no not yeah not like, like i that. don't care do whatever like yeah, it can't no. be that energy no it yeah, has to right. be devotion and this is where again like that's devotion mm -hmm. that's devotion and you know i met a young person a uh, beautiful young man who's so conscious and he's, you know, been working for new systems and he was really down in the dumps and he said, I don't see anyone changing. You know, I don't see mm. things changing. Mm -hmm. And I, excuse me, I said to him, uh, how is your devotional practice? And he said, I don't have one. And I said, well, do you think the creator is counting on you to solve this entire thing? <laughs> I was like, I was like, give it to her, like, give it up. Like we're, we're human, like we're the ground crew, right? So our job is to find what we love, to cultivate that self-connection and self-love mm -hmm. so that we are really well and embodied and cared for. And when we're in that state, then I can love you more. I can, I have so much love to give mm -hmm. because I've taken care of me. And it's the antithesis of what we're taught in spirituality or even new age. It's like, oh, you should martyr yourself. You should sacrifice yourself. If you were a loving woman, you would, you know, lie down in front of the bus. You know, it, it's, it's basically an implant, but uh, it's the opposite. It's mm -hmm. the opposite. And if you do that for yourself, you will have so much compassion and, and what a relief, like, isn't it a relief just to not have someone else? I mean, we have enough of our own shit to deal with in our own life, mm -hmm. but not to have somebody else's stuff in our, it, it's up to them. It's their mm -hmm. own journey. Yeah. I, it was making me think about something you said earlier. This is um, about evolution and evolving as humans. And you said, you know, I'm just, I just can't really be in something that's not involved ev evolving. You're talking about the, the couple of marriages before. So that's where my head goes is okay. Release, accept, complete love, and just allowing. And then at what point, because this is a person that uh, you, a, a husband or a wife is a person that you're, you know, in, in bed with, in the same home with spending a lot of time. If he never evolved out of in and out and venti coffees and everything else, then, then where does that go? How that, that's where my control mechanism wants to start stepping back in like, okay, the releasing accepting thing didn't work. They're still doing the things. And I'm just wondering if there's any listeners that are going, then, then what? Yeah, that's such a great question, Dotsie. So when you're in devotion, you don't get to make deals with the outcome. Mm, okay. <laughs> that's, the, that's the secret sauce. You have to be courageous enough to let it all go. And I'd like to offer that we can choose to keep the mantra, let it be beautiful, and understand that as we evolve, many of us are going to evolve, evolve into different forms in our relationship. Possibly the person that you're with is going to have an evolution. And, you know, suddenly he's going to be different, transformed. That's totally happening. Possibly certain relationships will come to completion. Possibly other relationships will change form. But in the end, all there is is love. And really, uh, my big question with Rich and me right now is what are we hiding? And it's very, it's, it's confronting and it's scary, but only through this honest communication ca can we truly become. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Rich and my vows were to support each other, to become 
uh, our highest expression that right. it wasn't about possession and likely many people and you guys the same. So what does that mean? Does it, you know, does it mean that, you know, if the relationship transforms that suddenly there's hate and, you know, it's not, it's just so not. So I want to offer, let it be beautiful. And I want to offer both and, and I'm not talking about polyamory because it's not something that I think I would ever engage in. You know, I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, you know, there is something about the divinity of that energy that is very sacred and, you know, sharing it or, or being, um, what I want to say, casual with it, uh, doesn't align with the deep spiritual essence that we are. And I mean, I don't know, I heard Aubrey Marcus talk about it. Um, and he's, he tried it and just said it was not what, you know, not what he had hoped, but, I don't know. I, I haven't tried it. So I'm not an expert on that. I would think it would be very, um, it just takes a lot of time and effort to have a polyamory for mm-hmm. our listeners who don't know is to be in relationship with more than one person, uh, sexual relationship, but, but also an emotional relationship. It's not about having an affairs or even it's different than having an open marriage. Simply you actually have relationship um, with other people, right, Julie? I, I right? think so. I'm yeah. not, I'm not, like I said, I'm not an expert. I just, but uh, I, had a, I'm, I could say I'm an, I'm a monogamous life form. I just it. am not monogamous to the death. You're ser- <laughs> serial monogamous is what yeah. we call yeah, you. That would be my term. Um, I'm curious. And then I mean, we need to talk about the cheese because there is only love. <laughs> the cheese, and the cheese. cheese. <laughs> so, so I had one question, one little question. So when you say that you're this, I find really interesting and um, scary too, in a relationship to say, to ask your partner, what are we hiding and ask of yourself, do you and Rich sit down and discuss it? Like, do you ask this question and then you discuss it? Or is it something that you just say, Hey, let's over the next few weeks, think about this and talk about how, how does it, how do you answer it? I think uh, each person needs to go in their own, in their own self. And I, and I, and it's a tricky one. You know, I don't think it's apparent to all of us exactly what we're hiding. You know, we have these conditioning and, you know, we, Mm -hmm. we we're, we're certain ways because of, yeah, the conditioning or, or what we thought was safe. And, and the point for us is it's like, I started cracking up. I was in the middle of my sage bush out on my land and, the thought occurred to me like Rich and I together for another 20 years. And I started laughing because, you know, it's like, you know, in a way we've digested that Julie and Rich that came together, that catalyzed that huge change that so many thousands of people listen to. I mean, that's like, you know, I told Rich, I was like, actually, we should just take our clothes off and run around our land screaming and take a victory lap because what we catalyzed and it wasn't because of us. It was, it was, it was because we, really risked a lot we lit we risked our hearts and we risked it to do it together and went through a nine-year financial collapse and Mm -hmm. just went through this whole journey together and you know everybody has their journeys whether it's health or death of a loved one or you know life visits us however we need to wake up so it's not unique at all um in in that but you know it's like so that's done now right and so now the question is how do we want to evolve and what are we doing? Yeah. You know, Rich and I were never like we, you know, we made this joke. We were like, promise me we'll never go to Home Depot on the weekend. And <laughs> that's just us. Like we, you know, and if you come to our house, you'll see stuff's not fixed and things are a mess. You know, we're, we're creative. Like I'd rather write a song than clean out the closet. Right. And I don't have a problem with it. So it's like, if you come to my house, my closet's probably really messy, but <laughs> you know, so that's been our joke. And so now, you know, we're exploring ways that we can um, combine my spiritual work and what's important to me with, you know, his work and the culture and what's important to him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, it's a big world and there's a lots of things that we can do and um and so it's exciting it's exciting and you know what i would say is even though uh during covid you know there's a lot of separation you know that energy that tried to separate us all um 
you know, we had that energy in our house as well. And, uh, you know, coming through it and being at a place where we're speaking intimately, um, we're closer, like there's an intimacy in that and a meaning and a connection. And it's not that we've arrived anywhere or that anybody has any certainty, but there is a, a bond, a friendship, a love, and, you know, we'll love each other till the end of time. And so really, if I'm taking that vow, it's my vow to support him in becoming all that he is meant to be. Yeah. And it's his vow <laughs> to do it for me. Definitely. <laughs> Kirk and I, during COVID, it, it just reiterated to us, I think we knew it, but we hadn't said it out loud, how very much we um, respect and appreciate and honor each other's choices. I, the vaccine wasn't for me, it was for him. We never had one single conversation about it. I was like, oh yeah, go do it. Yeah, that's you. He was like, oh yeah. I and I, I can't tell you how many people are just like mind blown that that wasn't like the central argument for a year inside of our house. And it's just, it never even came up. And, and then we kind of realized like, oh, wow, how much can we honor that trust and that just that, that pure love. And, and I'm not saying yay us, but I am saying it was, it was a, a time that brought us closer uh, during, during 2021. I'm saying, I'm saying, yay, you guys. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that's mastery right there. And in that you know, one that's, area. <laughs> yeah, that's what a lot of people were not able to do. And, and it's what ev all the energy was, it, you know, gaslighting it to not be okay, you know? Right. And, yes. you know, it was really fueling like a lot of fear and a lot of isms and a lot of science and a lot of, you know, lots of stuff. But it's like, again, if you just look at it, it's like, how could one decision be right for all, all of creation? Yeah. Well, I'm not saying that it's say an it. organic thing. I'm not saying that it's awesome. I don't think it's awesome, but as with every single energy in life, it does come from the creator. And so what I did is I met it in meditation, mm -hmm. bowed to it, recognized it, validated it, and told it, you know, that it was not allowed in my field. <laughs> I want to segue to food and how you feel. Is it important for someone to have a cleaner diet to be able to access their sp spirituality? The one thing that I'm really interested in now, and, and actually this is the core and the, the heart of Srimu, is uh, Srimu is my plant-based artisanal not cheese collection. And uh, it is a global mission of awakening. And it is a global mission of awakening, not because I am uh, under the idea that everybody should eat the way that I eat. Um, it's because it is a uh, food vehicle, a frequency, a carrier of everything that I've been talking about on this podcast. Mm -hmm. It's this unconditional love, non-judgment. I have a seat for every kind of eater at my table. You will never feel any judgment from me around anything. Um, each of us are unique. We are on our own journeys. We have collectively contributed to certain uh, conditions on the planet. Um, and I do feel that eating a plant-based diet is for the majority of the people and the majority of the time, uh, the only choice that we can make at this point, you know, just, uh, be, just because we don't want to participate in this violence against our our, our loved ones, our animals. Um, and we don't want to destroy our oceans through the sewage being dumped into the mm -hmm. oceans and destroying. So I don't think any human wants that. And all the ways that we're producing industrialized meat and dairy um, are inhumane. Okay, so we are human uh, and those methods are inhumane. So it's not our natural essence, right? So Srimu is a, a devotional offering for life. It's a prayer of a mother, the love of creation, that you are exactly where you need to be right now. 
and it is made with pure ingredients. There's no fillers and there are cultures and sacred intentions that are infused into the making of the cheese. Mm. So before anyone touches the cheese, we do a breathing practice and we have nature sounds in our kitchen and uh, orange blossom essences. We're, we're really creating the experience that we are part of nature. In addition to that, uh, Dotsy was mentioning that some mornings I get up at 3 a.m. to do a fire ceremony. Um, so during these fire ceremonies, uh, so fire is a communicator that transcends worlds. And there are many different uh, David kingdoms, life forms that co-create with us to produce experiences of life and evolution. And so what I do in those fires is I contact the life affirming energies that will support us to create a more beautiful world. And what I do is I offer Shrimu into the fire with these intentions. And my experience is that the product is just singing with love and vibration based on my customer reviews. Um, in addition, I also uh, energetically contact the trees that provide the nuts for Shrimu. So I'm in community with them. We used to be in communication with the tree realm. You know, there are some of the oldest elders on this planet. They've been around billions of years and they know how to share. They know how to take care of each other. And so um, I'm really entering into greater and greater levels of, of community with them. So at the core of Shrimu is community. We are a primarily subscription-based company. And as I come from fashion design and I love beautiful things, I took my time and created this beautiful branding. It's in a black box. It has this gold sort of modern hieroglyphic that was created by my dear artist, spiritual brother, Ohara. And he took the phrase devotional offering and worked it in reverse and it becomes a hieroglyph. So um, Shrimu is the next evolution of cheese. It rivals dairy cheese. Um, we are building community in our kitchen. So the sacred makers are the ones who make the cheese. And uh, I gave them that title because just like I said, let's feel into that we are enough right now. I didn't make them earn that title. I gave them that title the day they arrived. And I said, I know that you are sacred, come. Mm -hmm. So now the really exciting thing is we have opened up into some very limited wholesale, but you do not get our whole experience by only sampling wholesale. Um, but we are in Erwan. We've been the number one selling cheese in Erwan for over two years. Um, and we're opening up into some other specialty re retail, but really what we're interested in is developing this community. So there's 10 different offerings to choose from. You can customize now in quite a few of them. Uh, we have, you know, boxes at different levels and price ranges. It's not just a product in a box. It's much more than that, much deeper than that. You can feel it, not just only from you, but literally when you open that sacred box and experience that. Um, many, many times when it shows up at my door. And, mm. and it's think, delicious. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy delicious. I mean, that goes without saying, like you can't open a sacred box and then have the cheese be <laughs> shitty cheese, right? Like, let's just say that. But I don't think it's just, I, I, Julie, I don't think it's like rivaling dairy cheese. I think it's crushing dairy cheese. And that's because it's, as you've just described uh, so beautifully, it is made of love and not exploitation. <laughs> it, yeah. it, 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 it is, it's, uh, it is. And it, thank you for that. It, you know, it, it is, it is crushing dairy cheese because <sighs> I've given, like I always say, I'm not asking us to give up our love of cheese. Like I'm, I'm so connected to Europe. I lived in France, like all, so many of my friends are European. My European friends are freaking out over Shrimu. Love it, love it. And the reason is because it's better for your body. You're never gonna break out. It's gonna digest through your, uh, your intestines like a prayer, yeah. seriously. Yeah. I mean, I tested it for two years. I never had a stomach ache. I never mm -hmm. was like, oh, I ate too much Shrimu. Nope. Like it's just really, really curated and it's really, it's really beautiful and it's better for our animals. So when we participate, it doesn't matter if it's your intention or not, there is a net effect and the universal uh, accounting is happening 
even if you, even if it's not uh, apparent this lifetime or this timeline. Mm -hmm. So all of our actions have a consequence. And yeah. so you, we as awakening human beings should start to be um, co uh, like cognizant of that. And so why, why would you want to partake in a product that inflicted violence on a sentient being? Why? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, if you spent an hour in the factory, you would not eat that cheese. I know may, you wouldn't. May I ask you before we wrap up, um, what made you choose cheese? Mm. Yeah, well, I had made, um, I had just published The Plant Power Way, which is my first book. And I did, I'm the chef. So I did all the recipes in the books that Rich and I uh, did together. Um, and I was just absolutely shocked. I was making a warm cashew cheese that I would serve over nachos. It's on my torre de nachos inside the Plant Power Italia. Or you could put it on a pizza after you've cooked the pizza, one of my favorite. Cook the pizza just with tomato sauce, bring it out, pour warm cashew cheese over the top and add a vegan Caesar on top of it. Forget about it. You'll just uh. fall on the floor in ecstasy. And then I was making <laughs> um, the bonfire a version, a smoked almond cheddar. And I'd have to make the recipe six times because the boys and Rich and the girls, they, it would be gone before I even had it on the table. And I thought to myself, you know what? Like there is something here. And, you know, some of my business partners were like, don't do that, do a pizza book, do a smoothie book, and you're never gonna get an yeah. advance. And excuse me, I was like, no, I'm, I'm doing cheese. And yeah. so the name of my cookbook is This Cheese is Nuts. Can I tell the experience about going to Farm Sanctuary? Sure. I mean, so yeah. um so i went to farm sanctuary i called gene i was like gene i was thinking about you know me and my daughter you know on the cover and he said yeah come so i went and um and all of a sudden he had six handlers and they were very serious and they were like uh your daughter can't come in the ring and i was like okay i get that and they're like and your photographer only one of them and no bounce and then they're like okay if this cow charges at you go to the left if that other cow comes at you, go to, and I was like, okay, this was not what I had imagined. You know? <laughs> I was like, why are they charging me? Sanctuary. Yeah. So I was like, okay. Um, so I did a quick, just energetic, you know, set my intention, walked in, and all of a sudden they all lied down on the ground. And then the handlers started laughing and they were like, I, cause before I was like, can I put my arm around them? They're like, wouldn't advise it. I was like, what? So then they're like, okay, you can go, you can go. So I'm lying down with like one of the spotted one, literally like a dog with their, their head is just on the ground, kissing them, petting them. Then I was hugging Bruno and playing around. And I just had this amazing photo shoot, like amazing. And some of them stood up afterwards, you know, but they were very relaxed. Then the handlers relaxed. And when I was walking out, I said, thank you guys so much for this amazing experience. And they said, Julie, thank you for reminding yeah. us who these beings are. And I yeah. didn't quite understand it, yeah. but I got an email from Lindsay, who was the manager at the time the next day. And she said, Julie, we have never seen our cows receive a first time visitor the way they received you. Mm -hmm. And then she said, you literally had them on their knees. <laughs> yeah. They're very oh. spiritual beings. I mean, to me, and I love all animals, obviously, but um, I spend a lot of time at Indraloka Animal Sanctuary in Pennsylvania. And those, the cows, they're like on another, it's like, it's one up from us and the rest of the animals. It's just, they're, they're on their own planet. Well, it's in the just... Vedic, in the Vedic uh, knowledge, which is the most ancient spiritual text connected to this planet, the cow is the, is connected to the mother of creation. And if you even look at the, like what our ovaries look like, like just on a diagram, the ovaries and the uterus, it's like the head of a cow. So, you know, in India, when they make ghee or when they take milk, the first third of the milk is given to the calf. The second third is given back to the cow. And then the third third is taken. And I guess mm. there's a little left over. So the way that they revere the cow, it's a completely different relationship than the way that we are basically raping and violating these sacred beings. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so, yeah, so I guess they knew. They were like, dude, she's doing the not cheese book. They knew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's play along here. Know. <laughs> but you know, another thing that's really interesting is, and I named it Shrimu Do Life Not Cheese, Devotional Offerings for Life. That's the do, Devotional Offerings for Life. Mm -hmm. And I found out afterwards, I had a, a reading with my Vedic astrologer, and she pointed out this one aspect of my chart, my nakshatra in, and um, a symbol that's connected with my Vedic chart is a cow's udder and a devotional flower. Whoa. Uh, like, wow. And so, that, so now we know why, why cheese, why cheese? Now so. you know why cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show, Julie. You've been amazing on just so much to think about. And I appreciate it yeah. as someone who uh, doesn't consider herself spiritual, but you inspire but you are. me. But you are. I, but you, I've learned that I am and that it's that I might be hiding it. <laughs> no, no, you're going to let it out. Yeah, you know, yeah <laughs> thank you so it. much. Thanks, Dotsie and Alexandra. It's a, it's a joy and a privilege to spend these precious moments together. And I'm a yes. huge fan of you both. And thank you for all that you're doing in the world. And, and thank you for being supportive of me and, and, and sisters yeah. to me. Um, it, it really is deeply meaningful and it, it touches me. So I appreciate you. Thank you. It, it certainly is. Hey folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free. If you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>